Okay, let us start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure in introducing today's speaker, Dr. Shobhrushaj Chakraborty from Florida State University, USA. Uh, Shobhrushaji did his uh, PhD from ISS, all of you know, and for those of you who don't know, uh, then he went for his first postdoc at uh, TIFR in Mumbai, and uh, then he went to Florida State University, and recently um, he got his position at CISA in Italy, so he will be travelling to CISA very soon to join his uh, next postdoc at CISA. Uh, and today he will be talking about heavy QCD axion at the factories. He is working on axions these days, uh, which is a very hot research topic. Uh, so let us hear from him. So, uh, Shabrashachi, uh, I invite you to uh, give this seminar on heavy QCD axion at uh, the factories. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, so today I will talk about heavy QCD axions at the factories. Uh, B factories are examples of intensity frontier experiments which uses intense source of beams, very high luminosity, and primarily look, they, they look for uh, uh, rare processes in the standard model. Because these processes are rare, they are not, if there is any new physics, it will not be masked by large standard model background. Therefore, this rare BD is. Uh, are an excellent probe to look for new physics searches. The talk is about QCD axion, that is an axion which couples to GG dual, the field strength, uh, strength tensor of the gluon field. And the mass by heavy, I mean, is around few hundred MeV to one or a few GeV. The main motivation for choosing such a benchmark is twofold. Firstly, this particular parameter space is not uh, is poorly constrained rather in the experiment and secondly heavy QCD axion uh, ameliorates some of the stereotypical problems which the standard axion faces known as the axion quality problem now in the course of this talk i'll talk about what axion quality problem is what are the uh, parameter space that we will try to grow and the methodology of the problem now this what was done in, in collaboration with my colleagues at Florida State and the talk is based on these two following works. Uh, just to give a perspective of what sort of experiments we are using, what the parameter space that we are probing and what problems does Axion solve, I show this plot to you. This is a, a very schematic plot to show the present landscape of the experimental frontiers. They can largely be divided into three categories. The cosmic frontier, which uses uh, uh, naturally occurring events at the universe and try to look for any deviation from the standard model expectation. Uh, mostly it is dedicated to dark matter searches and so on. And then there is of course the energy frontier, for example, in EC which tries to look for the production of new particles. But this talk, today's talk, is based on the intensity frontier, and I reiterate, this uses intense source of beams, and therefore tries to look for uh, rare processes in the standard model. The experiment which I will mostly talk about is Bell, and the new physics particle that I will talk about is Axion, such as that Bell. Now, Axion solves many standard drawbacks, many drawbacks of the standard model. For example, it's, it solves the strong city problem, which is a fine-tuning problem of the standard model. In some benchmark points, Axion is an excellent dark matter candidate, and Axion can also give an explanation to matter-antimatter asymmetry or the baryon asymmetry of the universe. As I said, this is a very schematic plot. Uh, essentially, the axion mass that we will be probing is few hundreds of MeV to few GeV, and the couplings can uh, vary from uh, order one to ten to the minus three, minus four, and so on. Now, axion searches have received a lot of attention in the recent past, and this is a plot to show when the Pechekuin uh, paper came out in 1977. It has recently received a lot of attention. The citation has gone up exponentially. 
So yeah. probably it's a good time to look at this sector in detail. This is the outline of the talk. Firstly, I'll briefly mention what the strong city problem is and how Axion solves the strong city problem. However, as I said in the beginning, the typical Axion suffers from what is called the Axion quality problem, which I'll talk about. And a solution of it would be a heavy QCD action. Action masses are essentially related to the pion mass. Therefore, heavy QCD for to obtain a heavy QCD action, one would have to naturally break this mass relation. Now, in the recent past, a lot of model building works have gone on in this area where the typical mass action pion mass relation can be violated. And it also opens up this empty parameter space which is not exactly well uh, looked at at the experiments. After this brief introduction, I'll again briefly talk about the present searches at the intensity frontier. For example, axion bounds on the axion parameter space from pi on k on details. Beam dump experiments, the reactor neutrino experiments are presently also used as a beam dump experiment. And then I'll talk about our work, which is BDK. As I mentioned in the beginning, we are talking about heavy QCD action. Masses are around 100 MeV to few GeV. And BDKs or the rare decays of the B meson are an excellent probe for such axions. This particular process, looking for QCD action or heavy QCD action, is technically challenging. And I'll talk about the details because essentially chiral Lagrangian does not really work when the cutoff scale is above or around the GEV. So therefore, this becomes technically challenging. And this is this was one of the main motivation of the work. Now, B decays would be a channel where action is produced. Action has a also needs to decay. And we consider two of such decay patterns prompt and displaced. And this gives different constraints in the parameter space. And I'll conclude with some new uh, limits, some future directions that uh, I'm presently thinking or uh, would like to work in the recent future. Now, to firstly, let me talk about what the strong CP problem is. Now, the standard model Lagrangian can be extended by a theta term, which is a GG dual uh, term. This term is parity violating and therefore CP violating. Now, interestingly, this term can be written as a total derivative. And we all know that total derivative reduces to a surface integral in the action, which vanishes at the boundary. But this is true for perturbative field configurations. For QCT, because of instant on effects, this total derivative is non zero. Therefore, CP is violated at the non perturbative level. Now, this is only one source of such a term. There is another source which comes from the quark mass matrix. Quark masses are in general complex. Now, when we have a complex phase, it can be rotated away by a chiral uh, rotation of these quark fields. However, as we know, chiral rotation, under chiral rotation, the measure of the action is not invariant and it generates an anomaly term which is similar to this GG12 term. So, a chiral rotation can indeed absorb the phase, but it also generates a GG12 term. So, the total contribution of this CP violation is a term GG12, which you can extend the standard model Lagrangian with, as well as a contribution from the quark mass matrices. So, therefore, this total contribution I will write down as theta bar, which is the sum of these two contributions. Now, if there exists a theta bar from just naive dimensional argument, one would assume that it is order one. But if it is order one, then it might, it will have some drastic consequences. For example, an order one theta bar would generate a very large neutron electric dipole moment. The reason is very simple. If you have a GG dual, as I just said in the beginning, you can rotate it away, but then this theta term couples with quark fields, and essentially you can uh, extrapolate it by using neutron fields using heavy baryon effective theory. And for example, such a diagram would generate large neutron electric dipole moment. 
the present constraints are so strong that this term theta bar has to be less than 10 to the power minus 10. Now, this is the source of strong CP problem, which is also a fine tuning problem. That instead of order one, why the theta bar is so small? This problem was can be solved using axioms. So, for axioms, this theta bar field is essentially replaced by a dynamical field called axiom, and FA is the decay constant. Just to understand where this term comes from, one can consider a very well-known theory, which is known as the KSVZ model, where you write down a Lagrangian, P is a complex scalar, and Qs are heavy quarks, and this Lagrangian has a U1 Pechequin symmetry. Now, when the scalar field gets a wave, this Pechequin symmetry is spontaneously broken, and axiom becomes a Goldstone mode. When axiom becomes a Goldstone mode, you can replace the P with the A, it generates axion quark quark coupling, heavy quark coupling. Now again, just as I said, you can replace this axion quark quark coupling, you can rotate it away with a chiral rotation, but it generates, because of the action is not invariant under the chiral rotation, the measure of the action, it generates a GG dual term. So that's how the AGG dual term comes about. So you have a UV theory, all the heavy quarks are integrated out, and you generate the GG dual term at a scale FA, which is typically very high at around 10 to the power 10, 10 to the power 12 GV and so on. But once this GG dual term is rotated away because of chiral rotation, that's not the end of the story. The action also couples to quarks. The kinetic term does not change, but the mass term changes because it's a chiral rotation. Q bar will give an exponential factor, Q will give an exponential factor, and the quark mass matrix essentially becomes a M hat, where M hat is uh, this times the quark mass matrix and this passion is over here. The usefulness of such a rotation, uh, or choosing such a basis where this is rotated away, is as follows. Now, my theory is completely written in terms of quarks, and therefore, I can match it with the effective Lagrangian of mesons and baryons. And we already have such a Lagrangian, which is the chiral Lagrangian. So because of this, the usefulness of this rotation is, there is no AGG dual term now, but there are derivative couplings of action to pass, and there are mass matrices. And therefore, this Lagrangian can be matched with an effective Lagrangian, which is the chiral Lagrangian. But the sigma fields are the exponential i pi a t a containing the meson fields. If you consider a two flavor scenario with only two flavor of quarks, sigma would have only the pion fields. If you consider three flavor scenario, then it would have pions, kaon, zeta, eta prime, and so on. And the action is in this m hat, because m hat already contains action. Sorry for the notation, this curly m and this m are the same thing. This is a, a isospin symmetry breaking term, and this is the main part of, the, of course, chiral Lagrangian would have other terms, but this is the main part of the Lagrangian, which gives the potential for the action. So if I recapitulate again, I started with the theta bar. Theta bar was a term which is a summation, sum of the usual theta term and the term coming from quark mass matrices. So theta bar GG12, this term can be rotated away, but then again you generate action coupling to quarks, and then you match it with the chiral Lagrangian containing terms, and the most important term is this. Sigma again contains the pion uh, matrix, and the pion fields, or the kaon fields, depending on what flavor you choose, and MQ hat contains the actions. Now after some man uh, algebraic manipulation, one can obtain uh, action pion potential, which is of this form. So let us, for the time being, choose a two-flavor scenario with up and down quarks. Therefore, the term which you get is a pion action potential. What is B naught? B naught is the spoolion which gets fixed when you uh, map it with the uh, uh, decay constant. So it's just a uh, mass dimension, uh, it's just a constant, having a mass dimension. 
So, so what is the reason for having this uh, origin of this spurium? So it's isospin symmetry breaking. The mass effects break isospin, and in the chiral Lagrangian, uh, you have to add terms which uh, encodes that information. For example, uh, any mass term would break isospin symmetry, and then you have to add such a term in the chiral Lagrangian. Similarly, uh, e e electromagnetism would also break isospin uh, uh, the symmetries of chiral Lagrangian, and that also needs to be added in the chiral Lagrangian. So this is I isospin symmetry breaking spurium. So, Dr. Uh, let me just yeah. uh, try and understand this thing. So, yeah. you had this theta bar term, theta bar g g dual, right. and then you introduce the axiom. Yes. So, a by f a. Right. So, so the effective g g dual term has this coefficient theta bar plus a by f a. Is that That's right? right. That's right. So, in that a, a gets a wave. Uh, right. It has a scalar potential. And yes. it gets a wave and it solves the strong CB problem, cancels out this theta term, right? Yes, that I will explain just a little bit. Essentially, if I, uh, if I, if I just add this, I will have a A over F plus theta bar D in the sine right. square argument. Yes, no, but then you said that you rotate away this A by F A G G dual term uh, using chiral rotation. What kind of rotation you apply so that it is A by F A G G dual is rotated away? Yeah, this one. So this one. So you have to so the quark yeah. fields. Uh, yeah. You can you can rotate it away by a term like e to the power i uh, uh, alpha or i a over two f a gamma five q. Q goes to e to the power i a over f a gamma five q. So the, that will rotate away this term, this al a by f a alpha s by eta g g dual term. Right, but then would generate this action uh, quad couplings. Oh, so the chiral rotation, how does it work actually? This is, this is involving only gluons, gluonic phase, right? That's and right. Were, yeah, so, how does it so, work? so under, under chiral rotation, the action is not invariant. The measure of the action gives you GG dual, and that GG dual cancels this A over A phase oh. GG dual, which we start with. I see. I see. Okay. Right? Okay. So, the potential for for our case, let's simplify matters with two flavor scenario, and this is the pionation potential. And the main point is this potential naturally minimizes to zero. Therefore, it dynamically solves the strong CP problem. So, A over FA, or essentially A over FA plus theta bar, minimizes to this field value, which is zero. So, you, you don't have to fine tune theta bar to be very small, but it is a dynamical solution where the minimi uh, minimization occurs at the uh, origin. Now, once I have a potential like this, this is just a 2 cross 2 potential with pion and axion fields. All the masses and the mixings are very trivially obtained. And the mass of the pion remains as it is, with very small corrections. The mass of the axion is related to the mass of the pion if pi and if a. And all the mixings are proportional to this F pi over F a factor. So if I have a coupling of pion with fermions, it will be scaled by this F pi over F a to give you an effective coupling of axions and fermions. So this F pi over F a, sometimes in the literature, is known as the sine theta. Now, as I said in the beginning, axion can have other uh, interesting uh, results. For example, it can be an excellent polar matter candidate where the F a needs to be 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 13 GeV. This is through what is known as the Nisa Langman mechanism. And axiom can also be uh, a tool to have to solve the value genesis. So now the this A by A F A G G dual term is absent from your program. Exactly, exactly. A by G F G G dual is rotated away. But then I have axiom quark derivative coupling as well as mass terms, mass missing terms. Can you speak a little louder? Go to your previous slide. Yes. The student field and QR field with A by 2 to FA. Yes. No, you cannot hear your question actually. Who is speaking? I can I can repeat the repeat what is it? Yes, I can very simply, but I can. Can you hear me now? Clearly. There is a noise. Now it 
it's fine. fine. Uh, yeah, now it's fine. It's yeah. better. Yeah. 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 So when you are rotating the QL and QR field with e to the power minus a by two f a plus minus. Now, no, no, then Q will. Uh, so that will create an another uh, coupling with FF dual, right? I mean, photon and photon. So, mm -hmm. so why you are not considering that coupling? So it is not relevant to your work. That that is why. For this case, yes, but essentially, I think we had this discussion. Uh, so, if you rotate away any left-handed fields, be it lepton or be it quarks. It will generate WW dual coupling. BB yes, dual right. is not physical, and yeah, uh, it can be rotated away. But I mean, but, we can we can discuss this maybe later. But, yeah. Okay, but I think FF dual can be present, right? Because after symmetry breaking. Uh, yeah, uh, that means yeah. WW dual, yeah. BB dual, or after symmetry after breaking symmetry. FF dual. So you're yeah. right. The moment you rotate away the left-handed fields, mm -hmm. you will generate a WW dual. Yo, okay, okay. Thanks. thanks. Right, but then you again have the uh, option to choose the lepton to rotate away the lepton fields as well. But this is a simplistic uh, uh, scenario. You start with GG dual, you rotate only the quark fields uh, okay. tidally. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, now and, uh, as I said, uh, the axion can solve the strong CP problem, but and experiments are looking for such an action, and this is a plot taken from this paper uh, uh, to show the present day experiment uh, experimental landscape. And as you can see, this is the typical action QCD action line which follows the mass relation, and this is completely excluded by beam dump, astrophysical searches, Maison decay experiments, and so on. Now, if you go to much higher values of FA like 10 to the power 9 or 10 to the power 10 GeV, there are experiments, because this area is where axion can be a dark matter candidate, there are experiments which looks for it, but there are also very open parameter space. When you go to much larger effect, 10 to the power 9 or 10 to the power 12 GeV. But such a large effect has its problems, and this is the problem well known as the axion quality problem. The problem is as follows. The QCD induced potential is so shallow that any higher dimensional operator can move this potential away from its minima, therefore jeopardizing the whole strong CP solution. Now, if I just uh, uh, give some numbers about it, for example, gravity is supposed to break U1 Pechequin. And if this breaking happens with a higher dimensional operator suppressed by the Planck scale, then by nine dimensional argument, I write this in the Lagrangian as some coefficients, f to the power five over m Planck. Now this higher dimensional uh, contribution to the potential has to be less than m pi square f pi square, which was the term in front of the potential, which I write as lambda QCD to the power four. Now, what that implies that if you have to satisfy this, then lambda, the coefficient, needs to be 10 to the power minus 10 if FA is around 10 to the power 5 GB. Now, if you go for larger FAs, the FA which are still allowed by experiment somewhere over here, 10 to the power 10 GB, then this becomes an extremely small number, 10 to the power minus 30 and so. So it means essentially that you have moved the theta bar less than 10 to the power 10 problem, which was a fine tuning problem, to a problem where this lambda is extremely tiny. This is the source of the axion quality problem, because any higher dimensional operator can move the minima away from the zero, and therefore uh, jeopardizing the strong CP solution. Therefore, it makes sense to have FA around the TV scale or 10 TV scale, and the obvious motivation is this part of the parameter space is not ruled out. So we will be focusing on this part, a line which goes somewhere over here. That means you have to break this mass relation, and a lot of work in the recent past has gone in has been directed in this direction, where this mass relation gets broken, and you essentially try to probe such a region. 
However, in this work, we will not consider any model building errors, but we will rather try to try to probe what are the best ways to look for actions in this parameter space. However, if I just go at the beginning, before going into the details of the work, let me just talk about how these uh, lines are obtained, how these bounds are obtained very quickly. I'll mostly focus on intensity frontier. Of course, there are astro, um, astrophysical bounds as well, which constrain lower mass action, and these are from star cooling effects and so on. Uh, intensity frontier, uh, firstly, I'll talk about how pion physics can constrain actions. For example, uh, there are two ex old experiments, pi beta and p nu. This is, I think, ran at uh, ESI and pi nu was a triumph. Pi beta looked for pi plus decays to pi naught e nu. This is phase space suppressed. The branching is extremely small, 10 to the power minus 8. And pi plus going to u nu is suppressed because of chirality, chiral suppression. And the branching ratio is around 10 to the power minus 4. Now, if you have an axion, then the pi naught and axion pi on mixes, as I just said in the beginning. Therefore, in the final state, you can have a decay mode pi plus going to axion electron neutron. And these authors, uh, uh, Ulf Kang, Altman Sofa, Stefania Gori, and Robinson, looked for such an action. Now, if the action decays to uh, if the action decays to two photons, then the signature is equivalent to looking for pi naught pi plus e nu. If the action is long lived, then the signature is equivalent to pi plus going to e nu. And using these uh, results from these experiments, they were able to constrain the action parameter space. However, as you see, sine theta, which was a ratio of f pi over f a, is only around sine squared theta is 10 to the minus 4, so sine theta is around 10 to the minus 2. That means f a is only an order of GV, because f pi is 130 MeV and so on. So you don't get much constraint, but these old experiments can still probe certain parts of the action parameter space. Similarly, Keon experiments are much uh, can do much better. NA62 or Koto experiments, the procedure is the same. Keon goes to pi plus axion. If the axion is invisible, then it mimics NA62 structure. If K long decays to pi naught axion, if the axion is invisible, then it mimics the Koto structure. And therefore, significant parts of the parameter space can be probed. And here you can only probe up to hundreds of GV of the decay constant. Then there is this beam dump, and modern day neutrino experiments are also an excellent probe for looking such an axiom. The principal uh, physics that they use is a high energetic proton hitting a target. It produces a plethora of mesons, pions, kaons, axion mixes with pions and kaons, and therefore you can. Uh, constrain the parameter space. And the beam dump experiments and new near detector searches can probe a lot of the parameter space up to around 10 to the power 4, 10 to the power 5 GV or so on. So adding, summing them all up, you get essentially a curve such as this. However, what about B to SDKs? B meson has mass around the 5 GV. So it gives you an excellent handle to look for actions which are a little massive, few hundred MeVs to few GeV. But the moment, please remember, I started with an QCD action. So action only talks to AGG dual. And then I am looking for B2S transition. So it is already clear to you that it becomes a two-loop process where the action couples to the gluon field and you have the B2S transition through the W loop. The point of this rotating array GG dual and then matching with chiral Lagrangian, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because of the cutoff scale. Chiral Lagrangian has cutoff scale of 1 GV or so. So when you add higher dimensional next to leading order operators, they are suppressed by any momentum scale over the cutoff scale. If the cutoff scale is already 1 GV, but if you are trying to prove a few GV action, the next to leading of of order operators become more and more relevant. So therefore, the whole power counting breaks down. So I cannot use the usual method of chiral Lagrangian. I cannot use the pion action mixing phenomena or, kion, uh, or eta action mixing phenomena. I cannot use those. 
So one has to do this calculation for ABTP. And this is uh, the thrust of this work. Now, the usual P2S process is uh, what is called a penguin diagram. And you attach action here, which is a tool. I reiterate that you start with the action GG dual coupling. And the effective operator that you want to match is BS with an axion because, as I said, axion uh, couples derivatively. The whole point is to calculate this Wilson coefficient. But this is not only enough. You need to know if anything else gets generated, what are the contribution of those extra operators, effects of essentially operator mixing, and therefore one needs to uh, consider the RG equations very carefully. So, let me talk about the subtleties of this to do. There are essentially four diagrams. Axion talking to gluon fields, and then you have a W boson loop which changes flavor. And similar diagrams are obtained where you shift the gluon uh, loop to here, here, and over here. Now, because this is a two loop diagram, there are dub double poles, epsilon square, then there is a single pole, and there are finite terms. Now, this double pole can be both UV divergent or can be IR divergent. IR diver UV divergence, of course, we know when the momentum goes to infinity. But here, some here, there are light quarks. Here, there are light quarks. So when the light quark momenta vanishes, it can also generate an IR pole. So you have to be very careful about separating out the UV and IR poles because the effective theory can have IR poles, but its UV pole has to cancel out. So therefore, you need to separate out the UV and IR poles. To do this calculation, we also considered uh, effectively zero momentum of the external space. We checked that if you include momentums for these external quark lines, it only gives a correction of mv over mw square, which can be neglected. Okay. Another part is this particular diagram only has UV poles because the IR uh, poles can come when the gluon momenta goes to zero. But at that limit, this derivative coupling also vanishes. Because it's a derivative coupling, it picks up a momenta. When the momenta is zero, this vertex goes to zero. So therefore, this particular diagram only has UV poles. All the rest of the diagrams has both UV and IR poles. And we separate the UV and IR poles by adding a fictitious mass to these quark lines, quark propagators. So very schematically, we start with all this AGG dual coupling. So these two loop diagrams contribute, and they give us a double pole, single pole, and a constant. Now I have to find out correct uh, counter terms to get rid of these divergences. And the counter terms comes essentially by shrinking the W loop or shrinking the gluon loop. The moment the, when I shrink the W loop, I get a counter term such as this. When I shrink the gluon loop here, I get a counter term such as this. Adding all those counter terms, the 1 over epsilon square pole completely goes away. But that means that I need to have an AQQ operator as well, because shrinking the W loop gives me an AQQ operator. This is essentially A quark quark. So a very important point is you start with action gluon gluon. But you need axion quark quark just to get rid of the divergences, just to uh, make sense of the theory. This is not because of RG. This is just to get rid of the divergences. However, we still have a 1 over epsilon pole. And since it's an effective theory, you can add an effective operator to it, which gets rid of the 1 over epsilon pole. So essentially, you start with axion gluon gluon, but you need to have axion quark quark diagonal as well as axion quark quark of diagonal couplings or Wilson coefficient to cancel all the divergences. So even if you start with one of the Wilson coefficient, axion gluon gluon, you need to have these operators as well just to get rid of the divergences. So the method was before lambda UV where there was heavy quarks which generated axion glue group coupling 
you also need to have axion quark quark and axion of diagonal quark quark. Then you run it down, you match it at the MW scale, you get what your Wilson coefficient is. And the Wilson coefficient will have three contributions, one from axion gluon gluon, that's a two loop effect, so two loop factors, one from axion quark quark. From quark quark, it's only a one loop diagram to give you flavor of diagonal coupling, so one loop factor, and axion B2S. This is a three level diagram. After matching, you can again use RGs to the bottom mass scale and then use experimental data to go. Uh, okay, so this Z is the anomalous uh, dimension matrix and this includes all the uh, diagrams which I will not go into the detail. So most importantly, the overall Wilson coefficient has a contribution from the B2S tree level operator, the action quark quark operator, and the action blue blue. And essentially this tree level stuff, which is generated at Tulu, drives the Wilson coefficient mainly. Other contributions are also important and they uh, interfere destructively, but the B2S action operator is the main one, which drives the Wilson coefficient. These are scaled by the loop factors as well as the CKMs. So let us recap what we discussed so far. We started with an axion gluon gluon coupling. As I mentioned, because we are dealing with axion masses around the GEV, the typical methodology using tidal Lagrangian would not work, and therefore one has to do perturbative calculations. But even if we start with axion gluon gluon, it is not enough. To get rid of the divergences, you need axion quark quark diagonal and axion quark quark of diagonal couplings at the UV itself. Then you run it down using uh, RG equations and you match it uh, at the electroweak scale. And then you might again run it down to the bottom mass scale where the experiment is running. Now, Importantly, we have to do a back of the envelope calculation to see what branching fractions are we getting that will give an estimate of what sort of bound we might obtain. And this is the branching fraction. So at Bell, the number of signal events starts from the number of BB pair, uh, which I think is around 10 to the power 8. At Bell 2, it's around 10 to the power 10. And then the branching fraction from B to A, K, A, this is our calculation. So from quark level, which was our calculation, you can go to the meson level by introducing form factors and so on. And this branching, as you can see, you can probe for one TV of uh, the decay constant, you can probe up to 10 to the power minus six. So this already tells you that you can constrain one TV or even 10 TV with the help of uh, the B phenomenology, using the B phenomenology. If you remember from pions, we had FA around the GEV, few GEV. From kaons, we got around hundreds of GEV. But if you include the B phenomenology, B decay results, then you can already probe the parameter space up to a TV or 10 TV. The difference between these two plots are essentially where you start the, your lambda UV. On the left hand side, we started it from 1 TV. On the right hand side, it's 10 TV because 10 TV RG gives you a larger logarithmic correction and therefore bounds are more stringent. How much hadronic uh, uncertainty contribute? Ten around 10% uh, of hadronic uncertainties are there in this form factors. Yes. And if you take some ratio, do you think you did get cancelled also? It, it might get cancelled depends on uh, the momenta that we are, uh, depends on uh, the particular momenta that we are considering, it might get cancelled like people usually do in case of RK or RD. Uh, such uh, ratios were not essentially given for B decays. Uh, let me think of it, It's if it's true. So RK is B to S mu mu over B to S others but yeah so okay uh yeah with some ratios uh, this form factor effects will effectively cancel out but uh if you are thinking from the point of view of rk and rd then axion has to decay leptonically 
that mode we did not consider. So that's why we did not consider the ratios essentially. But in is principle, it possible, is it possible uh, flavor dependent action coupling to explain the RKRK star? Flavor dependent action coupling is possible. So, as I uh, said in the beginning, that to make sense of the theory, I already need a off diagonal axion coupling. So, this is completely possible. You, you can have an axion of diagonal quark couplings, but on top of that, you have need to have axion left hand couplings. Yes, yes, this is more important. This is more important. Yeah. Right. Here, since we only have uh, action glue glue or action quark couplings, therefore, m all the decays are hadronic essentially. But leptonically also possible. In leptonically also possible in principle. Yes, that's right. Okay. So we showed that we already got around ten to the power minus six. Now, what are the action decays? At bell 2, the process is you have a E plus E minus collider at around 10 GeV or so. It is constructed in such a way that it's at the resonance of the upsilon meson, which decays to two Bs, and then B is decay promptly, and e, you have a B to K A uh, at the final state, and then action decays further. Now, this B to K A was, as I said, our calculation, and thankfully, B to uh, action decays were already calculated by. Uh, these authors, and as you can see, at low mass, action mostly go to gamma gamma. But there are certain regions where action can decay to three pi amps. Some regions pi pi gamma. After eta prime mass, it mostly decays to eta pi pi. So action eta pi pi after this mass becomes the dominant mode. As I said in the beginning, this is only by considering action to hadronic. Uh, Action couplings to GG dual, they are for giving hadronic decay modes. But at low mass, yes, diphoton is one of the prominent channels. Now, let us talk about the bounds that we get. Firstly, the inclusive process without any form factors. We just took our calculation of B2SA. We found out what the branching ratio would be, that is, the decay of the B2SA mode that we calculated over the total B decay width and PDG gives you a B plus 2 C bar X, which is something like this. This leaves at 2 sigma, this leaves around 10% of the branching fraction to B to SA. And this already gives us a order 10, 20 GV bound from the inclusive process. And this is already comparing, uh, comparable to the bounds from the light meson decays. However, things can much improve if you consider uh, meson level processes. And Bell and Baba are both these experiments such search for any resonances which can go to eta pi pi or phi pi. Now we included if you have an axion, it will uh, have a signal over these standard backgrounds. And using these two particular mode, we obtained a bound which is roughly of the order of TV or so from eta pi pi. Phi Phi is over here and uh, KK Phi is over here. The reason for this weird shape is because after a certain point, one branching falls down and the other branching goes up. That gives you a certain uh, structure, something like this. Um, and then experiments also have a cut to look for a specific uh, area. But you can obtain a bound which is comparable to a TV or so. This was with already a what technique people use to calculate these decays of this light mesons? Parallel perturbation theory or? Very good. So these authors use parallel perturbation theory plus vector meson dominance. And these are at leading order. No higher order calculations are available. No higher order. These are, these are at leading orders, uh, sort of data using data driven approach, yes. So, and also for projections, for projections, we use the present uh, uh, non-resonant background. We extrapolate it to a higher uh, mass regime and then scaled it with the increased luminosity. And you can see Bell 2 projection can probe around 2 TV or so, or 3 pi channel can also probe around 8 TV or so. So these plots are all with assuming UV scale at around 1 TV. If you have UV scale at around 10 TV, as I mentioned in the beginning, the large logarithmic corrections from the RG equations 
you will only enhance the bound and the bounds can be as strong as around 10 TV or so. One extremely important part is these three lines. The lines are as follows. I started with three operators, AGG dual, and then I mentioned that just to make sense of the theory, just to get rid of the divergences, I need axion quark quark diagonal couplings as well as axion quark quark off diagonal couplings. So I essentially have three operators and three Wilson coefficients. Now these three lines are essentially varying these coefficients within a uh, allowed range to obtain a maximum and minimum of the bound. But when I go to a 10 TV scale, the UV dependence goes away and it's only the RG effects which take over. Therefore, this uncertainty on the UV values of this operator are reduced. So this is a very robust claim. It, 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 it implies two things. Firstly, the calculation makes sense because as you go to higher energy, the UV dependence should go away. And secondly, what it means is uh, 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 independence from the UV model that you construct. So any UV model can give rise to uh, very, uh, by choosing any UV model, it doesn't give you much uh, uncertainties as far as the bounds are concerned. Now all these were from prompt decays. How about displaced? Now if one uses the action decay width, uh, and then converts it to converts it to the decay length. One finds that the action decay length is around one millimeter here, one centimeter, ten centimeter, hundred centimeter. So in and around this part, action uh, displaced vertex can also be very important to probe. And because it's displaced, the backgrounds are also much smaller. And that we used in the next uh, paper with uh, two experimentalists, Abner Soffer and and the postdoc Emily uh, Barthole from Tel Aviv. Uh, and using this particular channel where the action can give rise to a displaced vertex, uh, one needs to have a, a dedicated efficiency for that. And again, the number of BB bar pairs at Bell 2 is around 10 to the power 10 and Bell uh, 10 to the power 8. This was our work. This was taken from Yotam's data. And for displaced analysis, you will have a different efficiency. Using this, one can constrain the axion parameter space using displaced searches. As you can imagine, this was the region where axion mostly decays to 3 pi on from the branching uh, plot. 3 pi on, axion decays to 3 pi on, displaced in a displaced vertex, can probe certain parts of the parameter space. So overall, the point that I'm trying to make is using both prompt and displaced searches, one can look for axions using the B physics result, rare B physics decays, and the bounds that you can get is around the 1 TV or 10 TV, depending on what you rescale you consider. So this is, this not only fills up certain blank points in the uh, blank patches in the parameter space, but this is also comparable to the beam dump experiments, which is shown by this gray line. Now, the axion can also work as a uh, candidate for dark matter and baryogenesis. I'll, I'll not go into the details of the work, but this is using what is... In the same uh, parameter space, is it possible to have... An, no, not in the same parameter space. So, so is it possible to have multiple axions? It is. So one axion for dark matter, one axion for uh, uh, this beam, yes. the river physics. Uh... Yes, that is that is possible. So this axion solves can solve the strong CP problem as well as free from any axion quality problem. And if you have the other axion that can be uh, that can solve your uh, dark matter and baryogenesis issues. Yes. But these two are uh, different, in general, different parameter space. I'm just showing that action not only solves the strong CP problem, but in a different parameter space, it can be an excellent dark matter candidate and biogenesis. Of course, you might ask, well, you started with saying the action quality problem, then one needs to be uh, clever either by choosing uh, the Pesequin symmetry breaking operators to be uh, less sensitive at the UV scale or some other mechanism at the IR scale to, to uh, ameliorate the action quality problem.
So I'll finally conclude no, by this. What, what I'm asking, can you write down a module where you can have uh, multiple axioms? Yes, that is possible. Okay. The other axiom will not be at UCD axiom, probably it will be some other, like pseudo-spiller, you mean. Right. We, yeah, we, it can be a dark matter. So the usual 10 to the power 9 to 12 GV dark matter uh, axiom also solves the strong seeking. But then it suffers from the uh, quality problem. So you, you have to choose, it would be great if you can solve all of this without the quality problem. But otherwise, you can have several actions. One can be looked at at the TV scale, or one can have a decay constant uh, to be much larger. Yes, in, in principle, it's possible. OK, so uh, future directions would be, as I mentioned, heavy QCD actions are very well motivated as it can solve the strong CP as well as the quality problem. But much of the parameter space are not uh, still, were still unexplored. Now, using the results of the B, uh, rare B decays, one can probe uh, the action parameter space which are open and which are also cons consistent with the action quality problem. There could be other interesting decay modes. Uh, we only considered hadronic decay modes because we started with the simplified scenario of AGG dual. But there could be leptonic modes, there could be other mesonic modes which can be probed. There could be other uh, ways, you know, we can like interactions for the axioms which can also be looked at at the, at the intensity frontier. And if the masses are lower than what I showed around KVs or MEVs, Things like cooling of stars with some new interaction can also be very interesting. So these are the areas which uh, I'm thinking of currently. Uh, the displaced vertex search can also be done using a dark photon instead of action. As I sh uh, show you, because of this peculiar decay modes, the action decay uh, lens are uh, something like this. But for a dark photon, as I'm presently working on, uh, it is not the case. And for a large parameter space, the decay lens are such that you can use displaced vertex searches as well. So using this, you can also consider or constrain dark photon uh, using displaced vertices at, at del 2. So this is all. Uh, thank you for your time. I can take more questions if you have. Okay, thank you, Shoporachi, for a nice talk. Uh, now, if you have any questions, please ask the questions now, or if you have any comments. So, let me start with a nice question that uh, in your slide you have uh, uh, shown us the renormalization techniques uh, in, your, in, in your slide. So, my question uh -huh. is when you are be, uh, using that renormalization to cancel out the uh, several infinities. You were mm -hmm. uh, imposing some renormalization condition and getting the counter term, which cancels mm -hmm. the uh, divergences. So now, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the uh, renormalization scheme, the mm -hmm. finite term uh, finite terms would be different. So that's right. Yeah. So uh, so then so, so when you are comparing the results with the experiments, then uh, mm -hmm. how your results uh, depend on what renormalization scheme you are using because. But, yes. Yeah. So in this work, we used uh, the uh, DR, the dimensional regularization, using the uh, uh, on-shell uh, uh, regularization technique. In principle, you can use the Truft Feldman process, uh, but if your calculations are correct, then the finite part would not give you more than a few percent of uncertainty. So that's uncertainty will go within these three lines. If the calculations are correct, if you use a different method like the Feldman process, the expressions can be different, but it will go inside these uh, three bands, essentially. So that gives you a theoretical uncertainty. And there is also an uncertainty of 10% from the form factors. So these are all under the theoretical uncertainties. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay.
Yeah. In, in principle, principle you should, should do thuft feldman but thuft feldman for a two loop process is extremely hard we tried it it uh, throws up some uh, something called evanescent operators because in thuft feldman you split the momenta in four dimension and an epsilon dimension and then you have commutators for one and decommutators for others and it becomes very cumbersome so we were not able to complete that calculation but then we went to the naive dimension regularization okay thank you so shobosha ji so you can also have d meson decay right charge d meson decay into pion and axion charge d meson so and also neutral case, neutral d meson can decay into pion and axion right so is there right. constraint so so d meson would be up and charm quark i think right yes. up and charm uh so in that case uh, yes of course you can have axion coupling to up and charm and i think d meson mostly goes to leptons and neutrinos uh, is is that correct uh you know also you can pion also can be case to pion yes so uh, as far as experimental results are concerned and uh, so okay uh, so let me try this So, so that, that would be a neutral current process, right? Hello. Mm, yes. Uh, or or you ha- you can have a charge B meson as well. Okay, so that charge can also. You can have a charge like, also. Right. E plus minus going to pi plus pi minus an axion. Right. Yes. E I. True. True. I have to see the experiments. Uh, per, pertaining to D meson surfaces, which I cannot think of, but if essential, the essential point is if I have something like a flavor changing neutral current process with the D meson, then the branching fraction is constrained, and effectively that means I can constrain the axion parameter space very strongly. Uh, so what one should look for is FCNC processes uh, using D D meson, if possible. I think that will be the best uh, bet. Uh, uh, do you remember the mass of the D D meson? D D D meson mass of the order of uh, much more the so this is charm and U so much U and charm U and charm so must be a five four three point something. Let me check. Uh, D zero mass is uh, oh so one point one point eight GeV eighteen yeah okay so Charge that one. means yeah, yeah so that means it if it is comparable uh, then it might constrain this part of the parameter space then yeah. one just have to look at the branching fractions whether they are comparable to D or or more stringent would be more helpful if more relaxed then probably not such but then i i can imagine certain this part of the parameter space can be can be important in that case yeah okay thank you i i just have to look for the branching fractions sure any other questions Similarly, I guess your uh, oscillations also mix, uh, give some constraint, right? Ak bar, dd bar, dv bar oscillations. Yes, with the, because you have a axion of diagonal couplings, yes. Yes. which is all this. these will give you some constraint. Excellent. So this is the operator. So if I plug b to s on the yes. other side, I'll also get the oscillation. But then that means I need two insertions of fa, one right. here and one right. here. So right. that right. might. That might mean uh, less stringent constraint, but effectively, yes, oscillation would give you um, would give you a bound. Of course, one thing is here we started with this, and we said these operators are important to get rid of the divergences. But the UV values of these operators, we chose it to be small. But if you have a UV theory over the lambda UV scale. We considered K is busy, which only generates a digital. 
but if you have a different uv theory which directly gives you b2s axion operator large b2s axion operator mm -hmm. then of course uh, everything becomes extremely strong every bound becomes extremely strong mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Okay, if there is no other question, let us thank uh, Shobhuraji for a very nice talk and discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.